All right. We are going to be talking about the last lecture for Unit 2, The Road to War. And so this will allow us to look at the international situation as the United States heads towards World War II. So, all right. What we think of World War II in the Far East, okay, really begins back in 1931. Uh, in 1931, uh, Japan began to expand uh, its empire in the Far East, and this began in 1931 with Japan's invasion of Manchuria, which is up here in northern China. And of course, Japan already has Korea, so it would make sense that Japan would use Korea as the jumping off part into Manchuria. And then eventually, you can see Japan's empire expanding, eventually all the way out to Burma and to the Marshall Islands years later. This was done for one very uh, simple reason, uh, raw materials. Uh, as an island nation, uh, Japan lacks uh, certain raw materials, particularly rubber uh, and uh, oil and gasoline. Uh, and so Japan is going to begin expanding into what they call the sphere of co-prosperity here in the 1930s. Of course, the Philippines is still part of uh, America. The Dutch East Indies belongs to the Dutch. Burma is British. Indochina is French. So this is going to lead to a lot of conflict uh, between Japan and the European powers. All right. And we'll eventually uh, get back to this story and look as Japan pushes further and further into China. Over in Germany, uh, Hitler uh, had legally come to power in 1933 and then had legally created a dictatorship uh, under what was called Article 48 uh, of Germany's Constitution. And so Hitler is going to make a number of steps um, from 1933 to 1936. Uh, in terms of readying itself for war. Okay. So let's look at those steps. Well, 1933, Germany had quit the League of Nations. Uh, 1935, Germany had quit the Treaty of Versailles military restrictions. Uh, you'll remember that Germany's military was to be capped at 100,000, that they could have no submarines, no tanks, no air force. They couldn't uh, import or export weapons, um, very small Navy. Well, Germany decided they weren't going to follow those restrictions anymore. And then finally, in 1936, German army moved back into the Rhineland. The Rhineland is this area here in west, western Germany. Yeah. Germany had been forbidden to have any armed forces in the Rhineland. And in 1936, Germany decided they weren't going to live under that restriction anymore either. All right. So quitting the League of Nations, quitting the Treaty of Versailles military restrictions, and then rearming the, the Rhineland. None of the other nations uh, 
specifically France and Britain, did anything to stop this. Uh, they protested it, uh, but they made no concrete stops to try to, to, try to uh, roll back uh, what Hitler had done. A lot of this had to do with the Depression. Uh, nobody in France or in Britain really wanted to go to war in the midst of a crippling worldwide depression. This brought about a policy called appeasement. Appeasement giving in to a dictator in order to keep the peace. Uh, and Britain and France uh, certainly deserve criticism uh, for this, which they have uh, duly uh, received. Um, but we often throw appeasement around a little bit too much. Uh, when we start working our way towards Vietnam later on, there'll be these charges that if the U.S. doesn't um, go into Vietnam, that they'll essentially be doing appeasement. Uh, to the communists in Vietnam. So uh, it's a concept that gets thrown a lot around. Uh, I remember in the 80s, you know, appeasement, if we didn't go down and throw Manuel Noriega, Manuel Noriega out of power in Panama, we would be giving into appeasement to a dictator, a dictator of Panama. So... Anyway, that is appeasement, okay? And this will become the policy of Britain and France over the next few years in order to keep the peace and not have to have another war in the midst of the Depression. Nineteen thirty six Italian forces under the command of Benito Mussolini invaded Ethiopia. Um this was done largely for raw materials. Okay. Um, partly to revive the glory of the Roman Empire and partly out of revenge. Uh, the Italians had actually invaded Ethiopia back in the 1890s and the Italians had been beaten by Ethiopia. So raw materials, Roman Empire revenge uh, and it's a pretty one-sided war. Uh, the Italians were, were using um, chemical warfare. Um, they were bombing hospitals, uh, Red Cross hospitals. Um, they were setting up what we would call concentration camps. They were executing civilians. Um, and this is all authorized by Mussolini because all the communications are being done by telegram. Okay? If you're going to commit genocide against civilians, try not to leave a paper trail. Uh, but there are uh, numerous telegrams where Mussolini signs off on acts of terror uh, against the civilian population. Uh, eventually, uh, Italy's um, emperor, Haile Selassie, uh, was driven into exile. Uh, here he is uh, arriving in Europe after leaving Ethiopia. And here he is speaking at the League of Nations, wondering, uh, is anybody going to stick up for Ethiopia? There was an attempt... Uh, early on uh, in the war, war, 
uh, Britain and France did indeed threaten to cut off oil to Italy. Okay. So Britain and France, two very powerful empires stretched all the way around the world, uh, threatened to cut off oil to Italy. Mussolini threatened war and they backed down. And in fact, the entire League of Nations backed down. That is to say, 48 nations backed by popular opinion of the Western world pushed out from threats from Italy. Now, Hitler took notice of this. And Hitler decided, let me get this quote to show up here. This is a quote from Albert Speer, who was Hitler's architect. From this, and by this we mean From this, Hitler concluded that both England and France were loath to take any risks and anxious to avoid any danger. Actions of his, which later seemed reckless, followed directly from such observations. The Western governments had, as he commented at the time, proved themselves weak and indecisive. So again, Hitler taking note that nobody really wanted a war. My God, 48 nations backed down from a threat from the Italians. Okay, and the Italians haven't fielded a decent army since Constantine. So that's gonna embolden some of the moves that we're going to see Hitler make after 1936. Uh, here are the victorious Italians and you can see uh, after that, the Italians are going to move into what's called uh, Italia Somali land, which puts them very close up to uh, British Somalia. This is in uh, Eastern Africa. Well, let's jump back over to the Pacific. Uh, in 1937, Uh, the Japanese invaded coastal China. Uh, hitting Peking, Shanghai, and Nanking in 1937. Uh, Nanking became uh, the site uh, of a massive slaughter uh, of Chinese civilians uh, by the Japanese army. Uh, what uh, was documented in a book uh, called The Rape of Nanking uh, by Iris Chang, uh, who was so upset uh, by what she discovered in writing that book that it led, uh, it is partially responsible for her suicide uh, years later. Uh, it is estimated that 300 to 400,000 Chinese were killed in about six weeks. And that is without benefit of gas chambers uh, or any of the other technological ways that the Nazis came up with with mass extermination. This included burying Chinese alive, practicing bayonet, uh, bayonet practice, bayoneting live prisoners, uh, beheading the Chinese, 
outright shooting them, uh, mass graves, uh, and so on. The situation in Nanking was so bad that one of the heroes uh, of Nanking in terms of protecting Chinese civilians was actually a Nazi. Uh, That's how upside down Nanking was uh, in 1937. And I would encourage you, if you're interested, uh, to read more about the rape of Nanking. Hitler's about to take some risks because, again, uh, Mussolini has shown that the wusses over at the League of Nations are in no mood to fight. So let's start with Czechoslovakia. which I had managed to spell correctly the first time. Uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, of course, no longer exists today. You now have the uh, Czech and Slovak Republic. Um, but at one point, there was a single country called Czechoslovakia. It had been carved out of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. Initially, Uh, Hitler only wanted a part of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland, which is basically Western Czechoslovakia right here, uh, for two reasons. Most of the population of the, Sudeten, uh, the Sudetenland was German and for raw materials. Uh, this is a very hilly uh, part of, of uh, Czechoslovakia. So coal, um, nickel, iron, things like that. Now, this led to a meeting uh, because Britain and France did put their foot down here. Uh, and so this led to a meeting uh, called the Munich meeting uh, with Britain, France, Italy, and Germany. No checks. And basically, uh, they agreed to allow Hitler uh, this part of Czechoslovakia they gave him this, that would be the end of his acquisitions. Um, and they agreed to it. Uh, and so here you see British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain shaking hands with Hitler uh, at um, at Munich. Uh, Chamberlain, of course, has taken a lot of heat uh, for making this agreement with Hitler, uh, but it is, there is a minority of historians who have pointed out that Neville Chamberlain, upon returning to Britain, immediately uh, started increasing Britain's defense budget. So it's possible that um, Chamberlain may have been buying time in making the agreement with Hitler. I don't know how much stock I put in that. Um, I don't think anything is going to rehabilitate Chamberlain's reputation anytime soon, but it should be noted again that he did increase defense spending uh, after returning from Munich. Uh, Dr. Seuss had different thoughts about this. As you can see here in this cartoon, Dr. Seuss was very critical of appeasement. So the Czech Republic, and eventually Hitler is just going to take the rest of Czechoslovakia. He's already got Austria, 
Uh, that's a story we kind of missed here, so let me dump it in real quick. Uh, also in 1938, um, the Germans moving in and taking control, what was called a union or an Anschluss uh, with Germany. Again, Austria has a large German population, and the Austrian people wanted to be part of Germany. And so it did not take a lot of convincing for the Austrians to open up the border and let the Germans come on in. So after taking Austria, Hitler takes Czechoslovakia. So this is Germany at the end of 1938. Austria has gone. The Sudetenland is gone. Slovakia will eventually be gone as well. Now Hitler had one last thing that he wanted to drive out of existence, and that is Poland. Now this is where things get tricky for Hitler. Great Britain had put itself up as a guarantor of Polish independence. As you can see here, Neville Chamberlain saying that Britain would intercede should Hitler try to do anything with Czechoslovakia. And Hitler's response that same day, you'll notice the date is the same. Hitler's really not worried about Britain or France anymore when it comes to Czechoslovakia. What he is worried about is the Soviet Union. Okay. Uh, Hitler has already made clear his feelings about communism and about the Soviet Union. Uh, and so he really needs to put the Soviets at rest, okay? put Stalin at rest. Uh, Stalin was already extremely paranoid. And so he needed to make sure that Stalin didn't get... Uh, Stalin's paranoia didn't lead to a war between the Soviet Union and Germany. Now, why does Hitler want Germany? Lots of Germans live right here. Okay, There is also the added insult uh, lots of Germans in Poland There's also the added insult of what was called the Polish Corridor. The Polish Corridor is right here. See how Poland comes up and actually cuts Germany apart from Germany? Uh, many Germans considered that an insult, uh, that Germans were forced to travel through Poland to get to Germany. So lots of Germans. Again, much of Poland was Germany uh, before World War I. And then this added insult of this Polish corridor that bisects Germany right here. Hitler is determined to go to war and invade Poland but he doesn't want to trip up the Soviets. So Hitler and Stalin sign in 1939 a non-aggression pact uh, between Soviet Union and Germany. 
Uh, this is Stalin here. This is Ribbentrop, who was Germany's foreign minister, von Ribbentrop. And this is Molotov, who was the uh, Secretary of uh, Foreign Affairs for the Soviets. So it's a non-aggression pact. They're going to be at peace with each other privately. They agree to carve up Poland between themselves. Stalin was no happier about Poland's existence than Hitler was. The two people who were sworn enemies, this Nazi non-aggression pact with the Soviets uh, was rightly seen as a marriage of convenience. Uh, the honeymoon is going to last about a year. On September 1st, Germany invades Poland. And on September 3rd, Britain and France declare war on Germany. Uh, Poland is also invaded by the Soviet Union. And so Poland pretty much ceases to exist by the end of September 1939. And here you see German forces entering Poland on uh, Danzig, which is here. What have the Americans been up to? And this is an important slide. This is an important slide either. Let's wind the clock back to 1935 and see what the Americans have been up to. Very shortly after Japan uh, invaded China, uh, the Roosevelt administration uh, published uh, what was called the Stimson Doctrine. stated that territorial gains made by force would not be recognized. And that's largely a message to Japan uh, more than anyone else, a message that the Japanese, for the most part, just ignored. Congress did not want to get involved in another war. Okay, this is only a couple of years after the Nye Committee uh, had published its findings about the last war. Uh, and so in 1935, Congress passed what was called Neutrality Act, which did three things. A belligerent nation is a nation at war. Okay, a belligerent is a nation at war. Now, weapon sales to belligerents 
no loans to belligerents, and Americans traveled at their own risk. So if a war broke out in Europe and you decided to go to Europe and your ship got sunk and you died, tough, okay? The United States government will not be avenging your death anytime soon. Okay, so stay home and see America for vacation. In 1937, um, the Neutrality Act was uh, amended uh, to institute, so it, it keeps, go ahead, just copy this. Oops. So no loans to belligerents, travel at your own risk, but it does institute a cash and carry on weapon sales that any nation who wants to pay cash and can haul the weapons away on their own boats, they can buy weapons from the United States but we're still not going to loan money to you. And if you're an American and you get killed in a war zone, that's your own problem, uh, not ours. Okay. So there is a slight shift uh, in 1937 uh, to at least sell weapons. Remember we're in the depression, so we got to make money somehow uh, on weapon sales. Well, what was the public mood about the possibility of entering a war? Well, the public knew, mood was, uh, no, uh, we do not want to enter a war. Uh, and that brings us to the Panay incident. Uh, the Panay uh, was an American naval ship. Um, that was attacked in 1937 in China. Uh, the Panay was actually escorting oil tankers uh, down the uh, Yangtze River uh, in China and uh, attacked the Panay, and the Panay was clearly marked as an American ship, as were all the oil tankers as well. Uh, the Japanese attacked the ships, causing casualties. Normally, when this sort of thing happens, you know, when the Maine sunk in 1898, we went to war with Spain to avenge the Maine. And when the Lusitania sank, there was all this talk about avenging the Lusitania. Well, when the Panay is attacked, it's not so much talk about revenge anything. Um, even though the Panay is an American ship, even though Americans uh, have been casualties in this attack, there is not really the sort of wide outcry for revenge on Japan that we saw with the sinking of the Maine and with the sinking of the Lusitania. And so Americans are very much against getting involved in another war, okay? even to the point um, of not making a, a big deal out of it if Americans uh, become casualties. Let's shift back to the war in Europe. Uh, Hitler makes pretty quick uh, Denmark, the Netherlands go. A lot of these become client kingdoms. So they're not necessarily run by the Nazis. They're just run by people who 
uh, well, they're not run by German Nazis. They're run by Hungarian Nazis or Romanian Nazis or Bulgarian Nazis. But Denmark taken over, Netherlands taken over um, very, very quickly uh, through the use of Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War uh, that had been um, perfected. It's basically a combination of armor, infantry, and air power. Uh, so Denmark, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands. In June of 1940, uh, the Germans uh, attack into France. Uh, just as they had done before, the Germans go through Belgium, as they had done in the First World War, largely bypassing the frontier here. Uh, the British and the French are caught completely off guard by how fast uh, the Germans are moving. Um, incidentally, part of the speed of the German army is due to speed. It is due to amphetamines. Uh, the German army was being given massive quantities of little white pills to keep them going. Um, Despite this overwhelming speed, Hitler does make a mistake here. Uh, at Dunkirk, um, Hitler allows uh, a good portion of the British army to evacuate. Um, and this is a mistake on Hitler's part. Really cannot type. Uh, there was a movie that came out a few years ago about this evacuation at Dunkirk. Uh, a movie that has its problems, but is worth uh, seeing uh, simply to give you an idea of the sheer scale of the evacuation. Um, is one of the largest civilian flotillas ever uh, assembled in history, possibly the largest, because the British sent everything fishing boats, yachts, schooners, uh, whatever could carry men and sail uh, was sent to Dunkirk uh, to help evacuate troops. Um, why did the Germans fail to uh, annihilate? Part of that has to do with weather. Uh, part of it also has to do with Uh, Hitler believed that Britain and Germany should be friends. And so letting the army escape was his gift of friendship. Um, a very bad idea because a lot of those troops would be back uh, in four years. On mid-June... Mid France surrenders, effectively leaving Britain uh, as the only remaining power other than uh, the Soviets. Uh, German troops marching down the Champs de Elise, Hitler at the Eiffel Tower. Again, Dr. Seuss. Uh, Hitler, of course, uh, makes another mistake after uh, Dunkirk. Um, I'll go back to here. Um, Hitler signing uh, the Tripartite Pact. Uh, this is a collective security arrangement 
Now, if you attack one number, you attack all members. Between Germany, Italy, and Japan. And this is a mistake because Hitler is now tying himself to Japan's foreign policy. And Japan's foreign policy is about to get very, very aggressive towards the United States. Um, Hitler reckoned that a war with America would eventually happen. But on Hitler's timetable, he felt that a war with the United States would probably not happen until the early 1950s. Uh, give Hitler time to consolidate his hold on Europe uh, and Russia. Uh, the Germans will invade the Soviet Union eventually consolidate that hold and then turn attention to the United States. But by tying himself to Japan, he is tying himself to whatever Japan's foreign policy moves are going to be. And that will turn out to be a mistake. Britain will, of course, attempt to go at it. Again, most of the other countries are directly or indirectly under the control of the Germans and the Nazis. Uh, Hitler will try to bomb Britain into submission, uh, what's called the Battle of Britain, uh, which is going to fail. At the end of 1940, uh, Britain's prime minister informed President Roosevelt that Britain was broke, uh, that they could no longer afford the cash and carry policy. As a result, Roosevelt came up with and eventually, uh, now we can't loan money to Britain because of the Johnson Debt Default Act from six years earlier. Okay, remember back in 1934, if you're in default, we can't loan money to you. So eventually, FDR pitches, and Congress will eventually pass this, what is called the Lend-Lease Act. This is about March of 1941. And this will authorize the president to lend, lease, or transfer equipment to any nation vital to America's security. Okay. We're not lending them money, we're lending them equipment. Okay. This is going to benefit Britain, it's going to benefit China, uh, it'll benefit the Soviet Union as well. Of course, part of the problem is getting the stuff to England. Uh, the German submarines are out in full force. Uh, some Americans, such as the former president, Herbert Hoover, are all in favor of not helping in any way possible. Uh, but eventually, the United States uh, began uh, pr protecting um, shipments uh, as far as uh, Iceland. Uh, so basically, uh, by the summer of 1941, the U.S. is Assorting the equipment to Iceland. And once it reaches Iceland, 
His Majesty's Navy takes over. All right, the British Navy picks up. What this means is that by the summer of 1941, the U.S. Navy and the German Navy are already at war with each other. Got okay. uh, the Reuben James uh, hit by a German torpedo. Um, various other ships, uh, the Salinas, the Kearney, the Robin Moore, are all attacked uh, by the German Navy uh, in the summer of 1941. Um, So we are unofficially already at war with Germany by September of 1941. Well, let's jump back to Japan. Uh, we last looked at the Japanese. They had taken significant portions of northern China and coastal China under control, right, and are looking for more raw materials. Uh, eventually, uh, Japan is going to invade Indochina, uh, which belonged to the French, um, Indonesia and Burma, uh, which belonged to the British and the Dutch, okay, and the Dutch East Indies, the second circle that we see here. Um, the United States attempted to put a stop to this um, by using economic tools. Uh, in July of 1940, the United States stopped selling oil to Japan, and about 80% of Japan's oil came from the United States. This, though, did not slow Japan down. Um, by the summer of 1941, the Japanese were getting very close to the Philippines, which was still considered an American territory in 1941. Two things were happening simultaneously in the autumn of 1941. One is that Japan was attempting to negotiate with the United States, while at the same time planning Pearl Harbor. Now, the most uh, Americans expected, most Americans in the War Department uh, expected the Philippines to be where the U.S. would get hit. The, whole, the, the, the tripping point of Japan's negotiations with the United States was China. The United States insisted <clears throat> that Japan leave China, and Japan was not going to leave China. In late November, a task force, a naval task force for Pearl Harbor left Tokyo. Oops. <clears throat> Early, whoo, look at that. Japan broke off negotiations on December 7th. The War Department alerted Pacific forces closer to Japan itself. <clears throat> the warning sent to Hawaii was sent by commercial telegraph. And so it did not actually arrive until the attack was already two hours old. Uh, the Japanese coming into Pearl Harbor <clears throat> uh, 
and hitting <clears throat> several battleships and destroyers landed around Pearl Harbor. Okay, various bombers, level bombers, dive bombers, fighters, torpedo bombers, etc., coming in to Pearl Harbor and wreaking havoc uh, for about two hours. Okay. And this being Pearl Harbor, and this being the main area where the ships were docked. <clears throat> now, it is a devastating attack. 19 ships are destroyed or disabled. However, there are failures by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. Okay. They did not attack the aircraft carriers because the aircraft carriers had left Pearl Harbor to go on exercises out in the Pacific. And so the aircraft carriers were gone. The Japanese had no way of knowing this because they were running radio silent. They were not receiving communications from anyone. And so they had no way of knowing that the aircraft carriers had left. The second thing they failed to do is they failed to hit the oil storage. which is along here, that's what all this is. And here's why. <clears throat> it's a great story. See this baseball field right here? In the maps that had been given to the Japanese pilots, this baseball field did not exist. This was built after the last bit of intelligence that the Japanese received about Pearl Harbor's layout. So when the pilots were flying over, they were looking at their maps, and their maps did not have this baseball field here. And so they simply flew past the oil storage, never bombed it. They were looking for a field, not a baseball field. On December the 8th, the United States declared war on Pearl on the United States declared war on Japan. That makes more sense. And collective security, the tripartite pact, December 11th, Germany declares war on the United States. I remember that collective security pact that Hitler tied himself to uh, Japan's foreign policy. All right. And so that takes us to the end of study guide two. As always, I'm available for questions. And I will see you in Unit 3 uh, for World War II proper. All right. Have a pleasant evening.